Hello everyone, I'm Cullen Kelly, and I wanna welcome you to Masters of Color, brought to you by lowpost.com and ravengrade.com. Now, many of us are probably already familiar with Low Post and their library of really excellent post-production courses, but if you haven't checked out Ravengrade yet, I definitely encourage you to do so. Some of the world's best colorists have gotten together to design a plugin with a diverse library of scene-referred looks that allow you to craft world-class images. My guest today is Stefan Nakamura, co-head of Features Color at Company3. Stefan is responsible for some of my favorite color grades of all time, and he's also worked with directors including Ridley Scott, David Fincher, Catherine Bigelow, and Steven Spielberg. We've got a great conversation in store for you today on the craft of A-list color grading. Today's episode is sponsored by Pixelview.io, an affordable streaming solution built by colorists for colorists. With an industry-wide shift to remote grading, streaming solutions have become a vital part of the colorist workflow. With a fixed monthly subscription, you can stream as much as you like, and with built-in video chat, collaboration with your remote clients has never been easier. You can use promo code MASTER to get a 15% discount on a hardware encoder at pixelview.io. And now, let's dive into my conversation with Stefan Nakamura. Good morning. How are you? It is uh, a privilege to meet you, sir. Oh, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Happy to be uh, talking color with you and taking a break from actually spinning the wheels and uh, so excited to uh, have you share your experience and insights uh, with, with uh, our, our listeners. This is going to be a really fun conversation. Good. Excellent. So, I mean, if, if you're game, let's get right into it. I want to take sure. advantage all the time that we've got here today. Okay, that sounds good. Your resume as a colorist is so stacked that the best I can do is just lift off like my fan favorites that represent like a little portion of all of the amazing films that you've gotten to work on and, and the amazing uh, filmmakers who you've collaborated with. But we're talking Prometheus, An Alien Covenant, A Single Man, Michael Clayton, Zero Dark Thirty, uh, Zodiac, Kill Bill, Pirates of the Caribbean, like such a wide range of really different uh, movies that all have such visual polish to them and were continue to be such an inspiration to uh, me as a colorist and uh, are, are movies that I loved like, you know, when I was in film school and have loved in the years since. So uh, you've got this incredible body of work. And I guess my first question is, Within that body of work, you have relationships with some of the most exacting filmmakers in the film business who are like, no, it's this and not that. It's a point that way or a point this way. I'm thinking specifically about uh, Ridley Scott and David Fincher and uh, a number of others that have a reputation uh, and uh, an approach to their craft as they're just very, very meticulous. So, my first right. question is how do you approach collaborating with? Uh, filmmakers of that caliber and who think and work at that level of precision? You know, I think it just comes through a lot of repetition and um, working with a lot of people over the years. Um, you know, I, when you work with any particular director, cinematographer, you really got to get into their sensibilities and how they view photography. And um, once you start understanding how they view photography, then it should become very intuitive for you as a colorist, uh, whether you're doing something that's desaturated or saturated or cool or whatever kind of um, emotional flair you want, uh, they want their movie to be. Um, I think it just comes through a lot of repetition where you work with people, you know, you learn about, oh, maybe I'll use vignettes on these kinds of shots or, you know, there's some light that, you know, almost every cinematographer couldn't flag at a particular time because of time constraints on set. So I'm just going to flag that before they even see it. And just through those kind of repetitions, um, you start getting a feel for when you're looking at every single shot, you'll get a feel for what it needs, what the shot should be and the feel for how you're trying to craft your images. And then, and then I think from there, they get really comfortable. You know, filmmakers can get really comfortable with you as a colorist because 
they don't have to micromanage everything. Um, and when they don't have to micromanage things and they can be more creative, if they have to micromanage everything, they really can't be creative. So if you're sitting on a single frame and you're color correcting and they're like, oh, put a window on the upper left, put a window on the lower right, put a vignette here, um, it's a little bit too magenta, it's, you know, all these kind of things, then you can get kind of caught up painting things and you, people can get lost really quickly. And then you start doing a whole scene that way. Then they'll look at it and go, you know, I don't think the scene looks good and they get really frustrated, right? So with, you know, as you keep color correcting, you'll get enough experience, you'll see how that works. And then in the future, you'll know, you know, if I do things a certain way, um, I could go down a rabbit hole that I may have a difficult time getting myself out of and it will frustrate the filmmaker. So let me go approach things this way. You know, it's almost like you look at things in, in an inverse way, right? It's kind of like a, a, a pilot saying, what's the worst case scenario that I could have? And let me try to avoid that, right? So as a colorist, you can kind of do the same thing. Like once you start getting a sense, a sense of the filmmakers you're working with, whether they're really meticulous, if they're really meticulous, then you know basically before you present anything to them, you better be putting things that you think is already a finished product for you, right? If there's still work that needs to be done and they're meticulous, they're gonna ask you to do the work anyway. And then the longer they sit there, the more frustrated they're gonna get, right? So, you, you know, just, get a gauge for your clients, get a gauge for the creatives that you're working with. And then you, what I always say is just make sure everything you present to people is something you think if you were the filmmaker, this would, this is ready to go for them. Like this is a finished product for you. And usually by that point, everything works out really well. That's great advice. I'm curious if uh, in any of those cases you will ever prepare contingency nodes or adjustments that maybe you're like, I don't know if it needs this or if I would put it on there, but I'm gonna have it ready just in case it comes up so that you can quickly put it on there if, if it is requested. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do, for sure. Um, I'll, I'll prepare a lot of those kind of nodes and I'll just, you know, have it ready, but I'll just turn it off, yeah. right? So if I have a feeling like we're going in a certain direction. I'm looking at the dailies, for example, and the dailies look a certain way. And if the cinematographer says, I really love my dailies, I want to stick to the dailies, but I know pretty much 80% it's going to change to probably something a little different that I think maybe might look better. I'll already have that color corrected. I'll just have it turned off. And then as we go through it, I'll be like, hey, what do you guys think of this? I'll turn it all on and then it's like, oh yeah, that looks a lot better. Okay, good, and then let's just move on, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that does help a lot. It, it, so it, it sounds like, interestingly, one of your, the keys to your success working at this high level with these uh, very like detail-oriented filmmakers and the other filmmakers you've worked with, I'm sure, is of course you've got good eyes and good hands and you do your craft well, but you're also really investing in being thoroughly enough prepared and having like cultivated enough trust that the foundation is there to uh, have a really successful and like fun collaboration by the time you are working attended with uh, these uh, collaborators. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's very true what you just said. I mean, it's like failure to prepare is preparing to fail, right? Yeah. When it comes to color correction, especially if you're working on a show the I, I found personally um the more seasoned the directors are the more they have a really clear idea of what they want right because they've done so many sh movies and tv shows and commercials and i mean when they get on a project they really have a strong idea of what they want and so when they have a strong idea um if, if you see their dailies, uh, you don't have to stray incredibly far a lot of times from that, right? You're just doing a polish and then maybe you can present some different ideas. But in general, uh, 
a lot of the really seasoned directors, they, they already kind of know what they want. And then it's really your interpretation of it as a colorist um, to say, well, I think that might have looked good on a 19-inch screen or a 65-inch monitor, but it won't look good on a 30-foot screen. Um, so let me go change it this way and present it to them this way. And that's when your sensibilities really come into play. And then they have to kind of trust your sensibilities too. So, um, and that just comes again, I think that just comes with time, right? It's uh, uh, the more you do, the longer you do it, the more projects you take on, the more uh, projects that have done well, kind of commercially, uh, the more trust people have in you. In, I mean, and that works in almost every creative form, right? Whether you're a music producer or, uh, you know, cinematographer, editor. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's the same thing. A lot of trust comes in through, uh, you know, the success of the projects. So uh, hopefully you get on some good shows. Yeah. Oh, how cool. Let me ask you this because you mentioned, you know, having your, your uh, take and, and your, uh, you know, sort of uh, perspective as a colorist. How do you uh, bring that into the mix when you're collaborating? Is that something that you're going to wait to be asked about? Or if, there's, if you're going in a direction that you don't feel is best, how do you voice uh, your, your take or, or uh, disagree constructively with your clients? You know, what I do is um, I basically look at their dailies. Sometimes they're, you know, they're CDL. So I have their dailies, then I'll have a note after their dailies, right? So I can color correct after their dailies. And I'll just kind of, because I have an, op an open note after their dailies, I can basically take what they have as sort of a canvas to start with. And then I'll, I'll start painting from there. Mm -hmm. And I'll just kind of put it wherever I think it looks right. So, uh, and probably 90% of the time it, it's, it works and they like it. Um, so that's worked really well. I mean, again, I think maybe 10% or less of the time they don't like it and they, they want to go back to their dailies. Um, in which case that's totally fine. I can turn off all those nodes and go back to the dailies and turn on another node and you know, we can, we can go ahead and just start working from there. I mean, I always have their CDLs as a backup ready to go at any time. Um, but in general, you know, I'm going to kind of put it to where I think would look right. How I, I mean, they're, it's, if, if somebody wants to work with me, I mean, they're hiring me because of my sensibilities. So, um, I'll put things where I think is appropriate for the particular show that I'm working on. And then we can have conversations about it. And for example, let's just say, let's just say the dailies are really desaturated and flat. And I'll put a note in after that on, on every shot. And let's just say I'll put in 10% more saturation and I'll put some contrast in, right? Mm -hmm. So then they'll say, oh, hey, that looks really great. What did I see? What, what did I have on my dailies? And I can just kind of turn it off and they can see it. And they'll say, oh yeah, it does look a little bit better, but I think it should, everything should go a little bit colder. Okay, great. But you can just basically put another note over the whole thing and make it, you know, you can group it, you can do all those kind of things and many different ways you can do it. And you can just basically get everything a little bit colder, a little bit warmer, a little bit more desaturated as a group. And you can just show them things very quickly that way. Right. So then now we're just starting to layer the grades yeah. and we're just starting to hone in closer and closer and closer to where we got to go. And you know, that can move very quickly. So um, that's usually how I approach it. And, and then people can see things, you know, cause I think when they see things on a single shot and it takes a really long time, they start looking, everyone starts looking all over the frame and then you start getting lost, right? Yeah. Oh, you know, that, that chrome bar is a little bit too bright. Can you put a window on that? Oh, that floor looks too bright. Can you take that, right? And then everything, people start getting lost in the minutia and then everything starts taking too long and people get really frustrated. Right. So if you start doing big swaths of color over full scenes very quickly, then it's then at least 
you can get the basic context of how the scene is going to look on a color level. And then you can hit the minutiae if you want later, which is a lot easier way to go. Then you won't have this situation where, you know, the, the creatives go home and they think, did I make a mistake? Did I just go too warm? Did I, get too, <laughs> yeah. did I go too saturated? Is this thing too contrasty, right? If they could see the whole thing, then, and, and you allow yourself as a colorist, like, I know exactly where I've, I've, I've sort of stacked my grades. I can pull things off very quickly. I can change things very quickly. Then creatively, it's really easy for, for the filmmakers at that point, because they can emotionally see how the scene is going to unfurl very, very quickly, right? So, I mean, that's a good trick. That makes great sense. And it, it, it's, it sounds that this is another, uh, everything you just said, in addition to being creatively sound, just it is so collaborative in nature. And it sounds like, you know, I'm, I'm imagining uh, my, my, myself in the role of a, you know, like busy and accomplished filmmaker and coming in to do my thing with you. And, and the fact that even just what you described of like, oh, you want to go back to the CDL? You want to see your dailies? That's right here. Like you've got you, you've got this, it's almost like you've got this tasting menu prepared of like, all right, here's where you came from. Here's where I think you should go. Would you like to go a little south of here? Just the fact that you've got all of that environment laid out and all that creative, that focused creative horizon uh, built out by the time everyone is working with you. It just seems like such a pleasurable and fruitful way to collaborate. Yeah, and, and I mean, I'll, I'll give you another thing that I think a lot of people don't think about, but if you start working on big visual effects shows, whether they're TV or, or features that are very, very heavy visual effects, um, a lot of times, I mean, the visual effects teams are going to be with you more than the director sometimes. Or with the cinematographer, you'll be with the visual effects teams. And visual effects have been working with CDLs the whole time. So they're designing things, whether they're doing background replacements, sky replacements, or doing full map paintings, right? Based on a CDL that they've seen. And every time you move away from that CDL and you start putting contrast in or you start increasing the color, I mean, their visual effects starts breaking at a certain point, right? So yeah. if you come in and you already know, you start looking at the dailies and say, hey, I think, I think I'm going to need to change the look of this then you have to work with visual effects very closely with the visual effects supervisors to make sure that you, you know, their work is still going to come out the way they want to with the grade that you need, right? And so even then, it's kind of with them, you have to show them grades on a full scene so that they can get a spectrum for it to see how they work because they've done so much work for so many months with a certain palette. And then now you're kind of changing it because you kind of have to, to a certain point. Like I think every color should tell you that. Like you, when you have CDLs, you're always going to change it to a certain degree because CDLs are basically being done on set. They're being done on a, a, a video monitor. And if you're doing a feature, you're, you're basically working in P3. You're on a 30-foot screen. You've got projected light instead of, um, you know, OLED light bouncing, you know, or shining through a, a piece of glass. And so... Uh, um, the look does change, but you don't want to basically be in a situation where you're going to have to redo all the visual effects work. So while you're sitting with them, you may have a look that changes what they're doing, but you just want to make sure that it's not destructive, right? So you can show them different looks and say, let's just take a look at this because I think this is the way I've worked with this director and cinematographer. This is really how the feature is probably going to look. This is probably what the finishing look is going to be. I can almost guarantee you. Then the question is, does your work fit into this world? If not, let's figure out a way that we can get this done. Right? And a lot of that, again, is you, you, you can do a lot of group, group grades where you can start adjusting things. You can show them, oh, you know, the sky's too blue. Well, I can take the sky a little bit less blue on all these shots that you did sky replacements on very quickly is that going to look okay for you are you are you okay with that because this is the grade basically that i'm pretty much always going to settle or she's going to settle down with you know oh yeah okay that works then at that point you're good the visual effects signs off on what their work is now all of a sudden you've worked with this director cinematographer you know their sensibilities 
that scene is going to go through pretty quick. Sure. Right. And makes- so it's just a collaboration for you as a colorist to say, I've got to basically satisfy the cinematographer, director, editor, visual effects. I've got to get all of this. I got to get everybody to agree on what the look is and to make sure everybody's happy with everybody's work that they've done individually in this process. I got to pull this all together and make everybody happy with the look that I've created. Uh, how so, cool. Yeah. That, I, I'm, I'm so glad that uh, you, we've already started talking about workflow and about node structure and uh, you know the nitty gritty of, of how you are uh, practicing your craft. I'm curious to know, I'm sure it's different on different projects, but uh, in general, are you working underneath a look lot of some sort or a look stack that remains unchanged once it's dialed in or are you just freehanding uh, on more of a shot by shot basis? How does that work for you? Um, I always w- work with lookup tables. It's like a mold to make a cookie <laughs> or make, uh, you know, I mean, think, think of this, it, it's like a mold to make, I, I don't know, like a cake or something. You can try to make a cake with your hands without a mold, but it's not gonna look as good as if you have a mold there, right? That's the best analogy I've heard in a while for understanding the utility of a LUT versus a, a hand correction. I'm, I'm stealing that from you. It's a mold, okay. <laughs> it's a cookie mold, it's a, it's a muffin mold, I love that. That's right, that's right. I mean, you, you, do you know what I mean? Like if you, if you try to color correct wide open without a mold, I mean, it's extremely difficult. Oh, absolutely. And you, I, I love that you mentioned the color cube right off the bat, uh, something that I will regularly demo to uh, other colorists and even to clients if they're interested, is like, I just wanna show you the difference of like stretching lift and gain and cranking saturation and what that does to a cube versus applying a well-devised uh, technical transform or a hybrid transform that's giving you like a you know log to seven or nine thing plus maybe a little bit of like character to boot. It's night and yep. day. They don't look anything alike on a cube. It might yield results that seem similar, like, oh, cool, I'm getting contrast and color out of both of those, but they're actually doing remarkably different things under the hood, right? Correct. And so it just feels organically much more filmic. So without that, I mean, you, you're in a constant battle situation. You'd be doing chroma keys and luma keys and, you know, just doing everything to try to recreate that. And it's like almost impossible. You're using the, the, the wrong, you're applying the wrong tools to the task you're trying to accomplish in that situation. Yeah, you're just right? making your life really difficult. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're going to be raiding into next year at that pace. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you're trying to create things without a mold, <laughs> right? Yeah. It, it's like, I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible. And uh, it's never gonna turn out as well. The mold thing, man, I'm taking it, I'm taking it. <laughs> and now I'm also just gonna go and try to, uh, on my grades, be like, all right, how can I make Stefan's mold and just make it all That's right, like that. that's right. <laughs> Let me ask you this question, since we're talking about, you know, like stuff that colorists and filmmakers get right and things that they get wrong. I'm curious, like, let's go back to the beginning of your career as a colorist. And let's look at that first year. And I'm curious, what do you feel like you were just intuitively getting really right? And where were you going wrong? If you look back at that artist uh, all those years ago? I mean, as far as my career goes, I think for everyone, your big break is almost always going to be that you're working with a cinematographer director that happens to hit big on a particular show. And then people hear about you and other people want to work with you. And then, you know, you start building your career that way. So uh, in the meantime, you just keep doing everything you can take on all the projects that you can. Um, Everything that you call it correct will teach you something forever. You know, Yes. I mean, I've been doing this a super long time. There's never a day where I'm not learning something. And I'll experiment a lot with different ways of doing things and just try to say, well, you know, I've been doing things a certain way. Let me see if I, let me see if I try something else. Maybe this will work or maybe that'll work or I never thought about doing things this way. Let me try it. And then I'll come and look, look at it again the next day and go, man, it looks pretty crappy. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, that's not bad. I'll put it in my um, tool chest. 
right? Yeah. So it's just constant learning and evolving. And, um, uh, you know, again, I think hopefully you will get together at some point as a colorist in your career with, with people you really enjoy working with. You share the same sensibilities. And then uh, um, hopefully their careers do really well. And when their careers do well, you do really well too. How cool. I mean, it, it sounds like one of the things that you uh, had a, a good sense for, even uh, from the beginning, was to marry your passion for good images and your uh, your taste uh, for good images with placing emphasis and priority on cultivating meaningful relationships with quality filmmakers. Oh, for sure. Uh, I mean, you you cannot. I don't think, and I think you can talk to other colors about this too. And I'm sure you've experienced this. Uh, when you don't connect with people, with a particular filmmaker, I mean, the project is never going to be great. Yeah. If you, if, 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 if you are just not connected to somebody, you, you're just sort of, you may not like them, you know, they don't like you. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's a myriad of reasons why, but if you don't connect with somebody, you could, you just cannot do great work because you just, you, you know, you, you don't have the emotional freedom in, within yourself to do great work, right? So it's almost, I mean, I, look, I, I always think about sports coaches. Sometimes they have the guy that needs a kick in the pants to do well. Sometimes they need, they, there's a player that they have to pat on the back to do well, that the kick in the pants doesn't work, right? Sometimes they're, they're, they're players they gotta yell at. Sometimes they gotta have players that they can't stand being yelled at and they have to kind of coddle a little bit. Like everyone is a different, is a little bit different. And the best coaches are able to recognize those kind of personality traits and are able to get the best out of each player that way, right? Like I'll, I'll, my language with someone is where I'll try to get the best out of all of them, right? It's how the coaches will think. How I approach this particular person, I, I'm hoping I can get the best out of them this way. And the same thing when you're in a creative field. If you are, uh, you're really disconnected and you're not getting along or you just, there's something missing in, in a collaborative effort with somebody. You know you're leaving stuff on the table. You just know it. Like you can look back and go, I left things on the table, right? So you hope during your career that you latch on to really, or you connect with really talented people that you get along with, you share the same sensibilities. So like you're saying about, um, you know, for myself that I've worked a lot with people that are really precise. Um, well, I'm a really precise person. So they like working with me because I'm really precise and um, they, they don't like to waste time. I don't like to waste time, right? So again, there's a lot of those kind of personality traits that come through the way I work and the way they work. So then when we work together, we connect that way because, you know, I really understand how they are as human beings. And once I understand how they're as human beings and, you know, sort of on a creative level, we can connect easier. Just like with any relationship, right? Yeah. The more you connect to somebody, your husband, your wife, wherever that may be, you'll be like, I can really connect. You can do a lot of great things. You know, there's a there's an old line that says um, uh, the best way to get a good spouse is to deserve a good spouse. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that the truth? <laughs> so, when you deserve a good spouse, when you, be, you you're a good person that's there for the other person, you're great. The other person's great. Then you do great things together. You know, it's uh, that kind yeah. of concept. Right. Oh, that's so inspiring. I, I, I mean, you're so right. Like, I, I, it never ceases to amaze me how fast, like, a two week or a three week DI can fly by when you're like in the zone and grooving and you know the work is good and you respect and understand the people you're working with and you feel like that's going both ways versus the other thing where it's like, yeah, man, we're just we're, maybe it's like out in the open and really contentious. Hopefully not. Maybe we're just not clicking, but like, it's just not that flow thing that I just mentioned, like the way that one of those two week periods or three week periods goes by versus the other is like night and day. It's so crazy. 
For sure. And, and, and I think that's another thing, a skill that we got to have as colorists too is, I mean, we work with, I mean, every walk of life possible on this earth. Yeah. And so the more you can build rapport with people, the more you can connect with people, even if it might have been somebody, let's say, 10 years ago that maybe you wouldn't have gotten along with. But, you know, we have to just keep learning, evolving and growing as people in our field so that we can connect with them. Right. So if, 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 if it's somebody if I'm working with somebody where inherently I would say to myself. You know, if I met this person on the street or I met this person at a party, I wouldn't be friends with them. Like, they're just not my flow. But at the same token, if they want to work with me, I have to say to myself, well, that's not their fault. That's 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 my that's my problem at a certain point. Right. It's 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 me not maybe being um, open minded enough or open enough or whatever that may be uh, in my mind that I cannot connect with this person. So I'm never going to say to myself, well, this person is such a jerk or this person's an ass and I can't connect with them. You're right. My thing would be like, well, it's my job to connect with them. And if I don't connect with them, I can't do my best work. So let me see what I can find as I keep conversing with this person and I keep getting to know them where, you know, I'll find a groove with them, with whoever that may be. I'll find a groove with them. And once I get into that groove, then everything else will flow. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's how I approach things really. That's such great advice. I'm curious, you mentioned your tool chest a minute ago. What's yeah. in your tool chest? What, what, are the, what are the tools that you cannot live without that you're going to use on every single uh, project, like as a, mm -hmm. at your base? What do you like to go to? Um, I, I mean, I just think it's just the basic stuff. You know, the, your, your basic color correction. You have to do your basic color correction first, right? So you're painting your canvas first, just like old film timers that did not have secondaries, that didn't have power windows, that didn't have chroma keys, they didn't have any of that stuff. You should be able to paint a picture 90% there just with your basic tools that you have, with your track balls and your wheels. You should be able to get to where you got to go. If you immediately start, start reaching for chroma keys, luma keys, power windows, secondaries, you start painting yourself into a corner. So the approach is always the basic first, right? Makes sense. All of these cameras with a good cinematographer, even if the cinematographer is not that good, you should be able to get a grade 90% there just with your basic tools that you have without any of the secondary stuff. Um, and then from there, you, you can start layering on windows and keys and all those kind of things. Um, and that's basically it. That you know, from sense. there, uh, um, each individual project has its own set of challenges. So, uh, you know, you just figure it out as you go. You're focused, uh, on, on the big picture, probably like you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. on, on like just the, the, the broad, uh, color, uh, adjustments as opposed to that minutia that you, you mentioned. Yeah, correct. And, and, and I mean, and there's a, you know, there's a logistical reason for that too, is when you get down to, uh, uh, big feature TV show, they've got hard deadlines. They could change their mind 10 times along the way. Um, shots can, you know, visual effect shots can keep getting rejected and keep coming back in at the last minute. Um, you basically have, a, have to have a pipeline where things don't break. It makes sense. It's like you're, you're, you ID the, the trouble up front and then steer away from it for the entirety of the process. Yeah. Very cool. All right, so I have another, uh, subject I'm really interested to hear your take on, you know, like we've, we mentioned uh, a, a handful of your many, many illustrious credits and, and uh, a, a lot of those films uh, that I mentioned. And uh, I, I would say, I, I think a lot of the, the films that maybe you're recognized for or the collaborations that you're recognized for are more in the vein of kind of like heady, like dramatic or thriller, you know, like serious cinema, quote unquote. But you've also graded so many comedies that look awesome and look the way that they, they, they look great, the way that all the comedies that I love do. 
and you're, you've done this in a, a sort of weird era in filmmaking right now where like comedies can sometimes feel like less considered in terms of their visuals these days where it's like I, I even had a filmmaker friend tell me uh, just the other day they, they were about to go and shoot a comedy and I was like oh cool like what are you going to do with the look he's like well it's just a comedy and I feel like that's a uh, at least in some lanes, that's a, a, a an attitude that uh, is has become a bit more prevalent. And I'm, it's just so clear to me, like when I look at Crazy Rich Asians or The Big Short or It's Complicated, it's so clear that that's nowhere near uh, your mentality when you're uh, mastering those images. Like what's your approach to uh, tackling comedy? Um, I don't think there's, there, there's any approach other than you're just trying to... Uh, basically help evoke emotion in whatever color that you're putting on for a particular scene, right? So if you've got a great cinematographer, it's gonna look great no matter what they do. They could do a comedy, they could do a drama, they could do horror, they can do whatever. Good cinematographer, it's gonna look good. Yeah. And then for you as a colorist, all you've gotta do is just extract the good, try to make it a little bit better, um, and then all your sensibilities come into place. No different. You, you, you use the same tools as you do uh, when you're doing your drama or you're doing a horror movie or you're doing anything else. You're using basically the exact same tools, but emotionally, it's just got to fit the show. So, cool. uh, and I mean, I mean, I don't know. I think, I think it's, just, it's just a very instinctual process that just comes through time. You know, and, and most people just kind of get there through time. That makes sense. It, it just seems like when I look at your work and I listen to you speak that you don't see any less opportunity to support the storytelling in whatever direction it needs to go when you're doing one genre versus another. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I can't remember what I did color correction wise on any movie I've, <laughs> I've done. I mean, uh -huh. I really, you know, so somebody would say, Hey, what did you do on uh, Prometheus? I'm like, I don't know. What did you do on this show? I don't know. I, I, I mean, you, you just kind of, and I'm sure you work this way. I mean, a lot of people work this way. You just kind of get into the flow. You start color correcting. You get into the flow. You start looking at shots. And you just, you know, you just kind of instinctually just look at things and go, I see this person talking. This is a distraction. I'm going to put a power window over them, a soft window. I'm going to darken everything around them because everything's too distracting. Yeah. You know, uh, sometimes you use vignettes, sometimes you use power windows, sometimes you do chroma key, sometimes you do whatever that may be. You just sort of instinctually go where you got to get to. And you don't, I mean, you don't, you kind of don't even think about it to a certain extent, right? Like a company three, it's really funny. We have, Da Vinci panels here. And I mean, a lot of them because we're, we're, we're on it for so long. All the buttons are, are, are you know, the, the, the nomenclature on the buttons have completely disappeared. It's off, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, they're, they're, they're completely gone. You can't see play, rewind. You Disabled can't see current, the that's gone. Yeah, you can't, you know, you can't see the parallel node, you can't see it, but it's the same thing. It's, it's almost like when you see, uh, um, like I, in the old days, if you ever see like an accountant, you know, they can look at their, the, their ledger and they've uh -huh. got their little keypad and they're kind of going like this, right? And they're typing in uh, 1,236 plus da 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 right? Uh-huh. I mean, it's just, it, 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 it's like they're not even thinking about it. They can basically look at something and they can type in all of those numbers and they don't really think about what they're doing. And I think it, for us, it's the same way. You start color gripping long enough. I mean, you'd be in complete darkness in a feature, especially if you're doing features. You're in a completely pitch black room. You can, you, 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 even if the keys aren't lighted or they're completely burnt out, or, yeah. or, you know, you, you basically are just color correcting. You know where the buttons are and you just kind of go with like a feel. Yeah. Right? So that's part of any type of repetitive movement that you do which is what they do in martial arts and, or, you know, jujitsu and all that kind of stuff, right? Like you just want to get to the point where it becomes, you do it so often that you don't have to think about it. It's just, it becomes a reactionary thing. 
Yes. And once you can do things like on a reactionary way where your mind is, your mind knows where you got to go and your hands just kind of follow, like it's, 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 it's a really great place to be. It takes a, a sort of a long time to get there. But once you get a feel for it, you know, things, things can go pretty quick. Like you can start color correcting really quickly. You can make changes really quickly. You can change your mind really quickly. Right. So, uh, and, and again, a lot of things that we talked about from the beginning of this interview is you basically want to get to the point where you're, you're proficient enough on the board where when you're sitting with a, uh, your creatives and they want to make change, you can make changes very quickly because you just know how everything moves based on the tool set that you have on whatever color corrector that you have. Right. You, you, you know it so well, it becomes just like an extension of you so that you can just move instinctually on the board. And then once you, you know, once you're there, like, it, I mean, it's, it, it, people can build confidence in you very quickly. That makes so much sense. And, and w especially when you have that, you know, like strong visual take and experience and that uh, emphasis on connecting and understanding the point of view creatively and personally that your collaborators are coming from. And then you marry that to, I'm sure when people are sitting with you in the room, they can see like, oh, I'm, I'm in, they, they watch you operate for 30 seconds. They're like, dude, he's got this. I'm in good hands. Right. 100%. Uh, right. You know, the first impression is really important as, a, as it is in life. Yes. So, right. And it, I mean, you can, you can basically see somebody when they're very proficient and you can see people when they're not proficient and if they're not proficient at something, they lose confidence very quickly. So, um, you always want to put yourself in a position as a colorist where you feel really, really confident in your abilities. I mean, when, when I started out coloring, I mean, I took the same approach, just like what you do with sports, it's the same thing, you know, it's like the only way I'm going to get proficient is I just got to be repetitively doing this thing. So when I started up in my career and I was, I would do a, you know, a TV show or a music video or something like this. And I know the director's done like a lot of big stuff. Like I just got to make sure I, I, I will put myself in a position where I would just say, what if I needed to do this? What if he or she asked me to do this? What if he or she asked me to do this? And I got to make sure I know how to do it. And I got to make sure I can get myself out of it. And I got to make sure, you know, like I'll put myself in every scenario possible when I first started color correcting on the board when I wasn't that proficient and just to make sure I can do it. And I just practice and stay late the night before my session. You know, what a great like that's what prescription. I, would, I would just be like, oh, I got this session tomorrow with this new director. Oh man, let me, let me stay late. And I just stay late and just, put myself in a position of doing 20 different things that I've, that I've seen the work of what this director has done before and make sure I can do the same things for them. What Very a, proficient. That's such a good prescription. Just, just constantly prepare, 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 because you only got one shot for that first impression. If you're confident and you know, you can do it like it, it, I mean, they can, everybody can feel it. For sure. Yeah. So, so you can fake it. You can fake it. <laughs> And faking it can work as long as in your mind, you know, I, I can, any situation they're going to put me under, I can do. And I'm going to look like I've been doing this for 10 years when I've only been doing it for two. Oh man, what great advice. I, I, I can remember years ago, the first, uh, I can't remember if it was a job or just a, 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 a like one-off gig that I was doing, but the first time I was put in front of like, the, the larger uh, resolve panels. And at that point, like having some idea of, of like how to accomplish goals, like what I want to do with the software. But it's so funny. You mentioned staying the night before and putting in those reps. I can remember just being like, Oh my God, like it doesn't matter that I actually know what I'm doing because I'm not going to know where that button is. If I don't put in these reps and same thing, like the, the for, for like several weeks, just like stealing time, early mornings, late nights, just getting comfortable with that musical instrument, because I don't want to look that those optics of like, how do you conduct yourself with people in the room? That matters as much as what's in your head, right? 100%. 100%. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a huge factor. And, and, you know, if people don't, uh, 
don't do that, you know, they don't know why somebody doesn't want to work with them again. Yeah. A lot of times. Right. And, yeah. and again, it's, it's sometimes got nothing to do with like your ability, your artistic ability. It's just your ability to instill confidence in your clients. You yeah. know, your clients have to have confidence in you, right? Like once they lose confidence, like it, it can fall off the rails really quick because they get really nervous, right? You are, you are the, I mean, you have to realize, I mean, I, I hope people realize, uh, the colors is the last person in the chain of touching that picture. So from pre-production all the way to the very end, we're gonna be the last people that are gonna touch that image, those visual images. And you are like the gatekeeper of those images. So once they leave you, it's over for them. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, it's over for them. They have to have the confidence that when you say, I think this thing is ready to go, they have to have the confidence and go, then it's ready to go. Yes. Right? And a studio has to have confidence in you as a colorist to, to, to know that you can do that also. You can instill that confidence in people that, you know, they have trust enough in you to say, hey, you know what, man, I got to go to the mix or I got to go do this. It's the last time I'm going to see you. Can you take care of these last 20 shots that are going to come in today? You're like, yeah, it's done. And then they never, a lot of times they never see it on massive movies. You know, they don't, they don't have to micromanage. They trust you. And with that trust, I mean, that's what you want as a colorist, right? You want people to trust your judgment about how things are supposed to look. And you want everyone from the producers to the director, cinematographer, studio, you want everyone on a production team to trust your judgment. And, sure. you know, that, that it, it, it all kind of ties in together about what, we're, what we've been talking about. Right. Well, we can learn a lot from your career and hopefully some of the uh, experiences that you've shared uh, in today's interview th from your ability to do that, to, to cultivate and earn that trust with the way you conduct yourself as an artist and the way you conduct yourself interpersonally and your attention to detail and eyeballing potential problems early and saying, no, we need to be mindful and make sure we steer gently away from that or avoid this, that all is uh what makes that, that that's what's gone into what you're describing being today which is a person who's worthy of that trust at that level like i got you creatively logistically interpersonally if it's in my hands it's in good hands that's right 100 percent. if they if, if if they trust you you you're going to be in great shape well yeah. stefan you've been so generous with your time this morning but i've got one more question for you Yep. I, I'm so interested in the moment that we're in of with motion imaging and, you know, the, the time period that uh, you have uh, spanned in your career. So I'm curious about your, uh, you know, like sort of predictions or take on like, where are we in the history of motion imaging and where are we going in terms of uh, this craft and just the way we consume motion images in general? What's coming next? Oh, man, this is the most exciting time. I mean, it really is. It, this is the most exciting. Every everyone who's an aspiring colorist or everyone who's coloring should be beyond excited about the time that we're in because of the just the sheer number of content that it is out there, right? There's so much content out there. People are just can be so creative with what they're doing, and we're mastering it. P3 and HDR and Rec 709 and Dolby Vision and IMAX. I mean, there are just so many different formats. There's so, and, and in the future, I mean, there are going to be so many different, you know, much more. And I mean, I, I, I know a lot of the uh, technologists for um, a lot of the uh, uh, future technology for screens that are going to be coming in the future. I mean, they're just like exciting stuff coming up. Just a really exciting exhibition um, um, things that are going to be coming out, and for us as colorists, again, that's going to we're going to have to re relearn some of our sensibilities as we get um, you know different kind of 
uh, screens, large format screens and giant video walls and, you know, things like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I look at the, uh, a lot of the TV content out there. I mean, it's just fantastic. There's just so much good stuff out there. And there's much more creativity now. And the studios, the, you know, the television studios just kind of allow a lot more leeway as far as the look. So it allows colorists and cinematographers to you know, explore more. I mean, that's like completely exciting. I mean, that's really crazy. I mean, it's going to push our our um you know our field into like a completely another level because they're just allowing us to go go where maybe we wouldn't have gone before which is really fantastic so again i mean i think all, i mean all you got to do is just go pop on netflix or you know hbo max or what i mean whatever i mean it's just it's just a lot of incredible stuff being done by a lot of incredible talented colorists and I mean, I look at the shows and I just go, man, that's a real, I mean, I tell my wife all the time, man, that's a really good grade. Yeah, you know, I'm the sure. The series looks really good. And suddenly she's like, you know, that, that, this show kind of doesn't look good. I'm like, yeah, it kind of doesn't look good. Hey, but you know what? Give them props to try, right? For sure. Maybe it doesn't work for me, but it's maybe it works for somebody else. I don't know. Like, obviously, other people thought that looked good. So <laughs> I'll put that in my memory bank and go like, well, maybe there's some hybrid between that thing that maybe I don't think looks good and something that I think looks good. Maybe there's, there's some, something in between. And again, it just like opens your mind to different ways you can approach color. Well, right? isn't, it, isn't it wonderful how high the bar has climbed for like the baseline of like visual polish that consumers expect of the average show or whatever, like that bar has gotten so high. So it's high. awesome. So high, it's just, it's, it's just incredible. I mean, even from, from like, documentaries and even reality some of some of these reality shows yeah that stuff looks yeah, good the colors are good man yeah. you know there's some good color on that show yeah. right in the past it was like oh man i think it's sloppy the shots aren't matching shot to shot yeah now i'm just like hey you know even i mean I'm, I'm not trying to put anybody down but you know even stuff that like just kind of shot on video you know it had to go for some colors it's like you're doing a fantastic job on those shows Whereas before, eh, maybe just let it go, you know, yeah. it's like. Who cares whatever. if it's a point pink over there and two yeah. red over there? Yeah. yeah, now oh. it's like everything looks good. Everything looks a lot better. So the, exactly what you just said. I mean, the bar has been raised and I think that's really great for our industry. You know, it forces everybody to get better. And, um, um, you know, our bar has definitely been raised and we just got to continue to keep raising it. So. It's an exciting time for everybody. I think that wants to be a colorist that that is coloring. I mean, it's a it's it's a really really great time for all of us. I wholeheartedly agree with you, and I'm going to walk away from this conversation so excited to. I'm going to I'm going to spin the wheels today with renewed uh, uh, joy and vigor after uh, this chat. So I, I want to thank you so much for uh, sharing your time and your uh, insights with us, Stefan. Yeah, I appreciate it. No problem. Hope we'll cross paths again soon. All right, sounds good. Take Thanks care. So much. Okay. Bye. -bye. I come.